Join us as career changers, company leaders, industry experts, and others who have been in your shoes share their stories, insights, and lessons learned to help you find enjoyment through employment in the tech world. I'm Nemo Ashong, and this is the Employment Podcast. Hey there, employees. How are you? Nemo here. And let's jive into today's, I think I just said jive. Let's go with that. Let's dive and jive into today's episode. We have Ventress Lamb on the episode. And Ventress's story is one that is not only inspiring, but also quite actionable. I like to let these conversations just take a direction that they need to take. And the direction where this really got to went back to one of our core values here at Enjoyment, which is demonstrating your value. Ventress calls it being useful. And we take the time to explore how Ventress has been useful and how that has played out for her in her career. It's fun because just coming from that one aspect, that one foundation of giving and adding value, she's been able to go and not only change her career, but build her own business. And as we discussed toward the end of the episode, position herself in a way to help make an impact in a major way to other entrepreneurs and society as a whole. It's really fun to be able to say something like that because those are the kinds of people that we have come on employment, the people who have really found a way to tap into what really brings them joy right now and to create the possibilities that they want to see in the world and find a way to make a contribution, not just to themselves, but to those around them and to the larger communities as a whole. I'm going to make sure that you know that you have the opportunity to explore your employment more tangibly through our possibility playground. If you go over to employees.com, which is the home of the employees and our employment community, you'll find upcoming workshops, discussions, and just an ongoing conversation of things that employees are doing and topics that are important to individuals just like you who are ready to make a move, who are ready to create a possibility where they can experience joy each and every day. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be playing. We're going to be exploring new ways to help you find enjoyment on a consistent basis. So come over to the employees community over at employees.com and see what we're up to right now. Let us know what you need and see how you can get involved. We're doing workshops on personal branding, discovering your passion and purpose, translating your past skills to new roles and creating a new possibility for the impact that you wanna make out in the world. Needless to say, we're having a lot of fun and we're making a lot of great things happen. And we'd love for you to come be a part of it. Just go to employees.com and we'll see you there. All right, here's a fantastic episode with Ventress Lamb. Enjoy. Hello, and welcome to the Enjoyment Podcast, where we're focused on helping people just like you find enjoyment through employment. Today, we have Ventress Lamb on the show. Ventress, would you like to say hello to employees out there? Hi, employees. <sighs> hello. I'm going to answer on their, on their behalf, right? <laughs> um, so, employees, let me let you know a little bit about Ventress here. Uh, Ventress is the founder of Bedelia, an early stage product consultant shop that helps emerging entrepreneurs translate their vision into reality through thought partnership, product strategy, and technical implementation. She specializes in helping non-technical founders bridge the technology literacy gap and is a vocal proponent of technology access as an opportunity for empowerment for women and minorities. Before Bedelia, she spent six years working at Goldman Sachs in financial operations and project management. Ventures, I am so thrilled that you come to the table here with all of these experiences because I think it's just going to really help shape and give us all a little bit of direction as, to, as we look on to take on our employment journeys. Before yeah, we get into your journey, though, we'd love to know a little more about you. Would you mind letting us know about your life, love, work, and passion? Uh, yeah. Um, so I started um, my life, my career life, pretty much lost. Um, I knew I wanted to be rich, and I knew that um, and that was that was pretty much it. And I, I knew I wanted to wear badass power suits, and that was about it. Um, so that landed me at Goldman Sachs. Uh, long before I really knew what Goldman Sachs did. Um, so I started, so I started my career in Goldman Sachs out of Hong Kong. Uh, and you know, it was fun. I was good at what I did. Um, and that got me a lot of travel opportunities. I moved from Hong Kong to Singapore, um, and then to New York. 
Uh, and short, after a while, I realized that I wanted to settle down a little bit more, be a little bit closer to family. My family's in Toronto, up in Canada. Uh, and New York's an hour and a half flight away, so settled down in New York. Uh, I quickly realized that as soon as the traveling stopped, work stopped being fun. Um, it was the, the traveling that I enjoyed uh, and the actual uh, day-to-day grind less interesting. Um, so that got me on a bit of a path of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, what I'll say is, you know, at a job like Goldman Sachs, that where you typically spend 12 to 14 hours a day at the office, there's very little mental space left for you to think about what you want to do next in your life. Um, and so for me, it became a process of dragging my feet, trying to find out what was next. And every time I tried to make the move it it never really happened just because I never really had the space to think about it clearly um so what started happening was I started showing up to work later and later started leaving earlier and earlier started taking more and more days off um until one day I was maybe two weeks into a sick leave and I was like okay I am being you know I've got to be a grown-up about this go back to work um suck it up And on my way to work that day, I had a nervous breakdown on the train, um, full out sobbing, shuddering, snotty nose, all of that, um, got into the office and was like, to my manager, I don't think I'm okay, I need to take the time off. Um, And when I did take the time off, I finally uh, went on medical leave, I finally had that mental space to start thinking about what I wanted to do next. Um, But even then, that was like a full year journey before I... I figured out a space for myself in the tech startup space. I knew I was interested in tech. I knew it was exciting to see that all these people were doing cool stuff, um, really harnessing technology to create cool products. This was back in uh, 2012. Uh, and I didn't know where, where necessarily I fit in. I taught myself how to program. I thought I might be a developer. Um, I started my own startup for a point in time, um, tried to create a startup, tried to create a software startup, also tried to create a lingerie startup. Um, a lot of different experiments that, uh, that never wound up going anywhere, but did a really great job of giving me an experience of figuring out what I liked and what I didn't like, what I was good at and what I cared about. Um, eventually what I Uh, my start into consulting was um, very unexpected. What I discovered was a great way to get into the startup world is to, especially if you have no previous experience, um, is to go in and just say, hey, I'm a generally competent person. Can I give you a week of my time if I get to shadow you and your team just to see what you're doing? You know, worst case scenario, you get a few, you get a week of free manpower and I get a week of experience in whatever you're doing. Um, that way, I got to see a lot of different industries, a lot of different verticals, um, a lot of different positions and problems that I never would have got, been able to see otherwise. Um, and very quickly realized that what I was doing for these companies was giving them product insight and that this was something that some of them would be willing to pay for beyond that first week. Um, so from there, I got some really great uh so just some really great um, vocal support. They, a lot of my clients spread my name around the uh, community, the startup community in New York, um, and the work came flowing in before I even knew it. Um, and that was how I got into consulting. I started at $20 an hour, slowly started bumping that up. Um, and uh, now I make a real grown-up salary again. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, so it, it's been a long journey. And, you know, even today, I still, because of the nature of what I do, it's relatively flexible. I take on different clients at different times. And even today, I still go through that process of experimentation to see, is this really the best use of my time? Am I, do I still love it? And, um, you know, am I bringing value to myself and to to the people that I'm working with? So it's it's a, it's a constant journey. I am so excited here. I like this journey right here is is quite quite fantastic, and I I want to just thank you firstly for just being very open and honest about your journey and and like just 
all the trials and tribulations along the way. And it seems, it seems to me that you're like, there is no de like actual destination. Like even right now in the middle of it, you're here. You seem, you seem to be in a place where you're like, this brings me great joy. I'm happy with this. But at the same time, I still need to check in myself and there might be even levels above that. And when, when that time comes, it seems like it's not going to take you by surprise, but you've all, but you've been able to in implement some more uh, insights and such into that. Yeah, definitely. I, it's funny. So shortly after I left Goldman during that medical leave, you know, I, I don't highlight it a lot in these conversations, but it was a depressed, I, I was in a very deep depression and, and, you know, it was always the only thing that I could really put my finger on was that I wanted to be a useful person. What I, and what useful meant was something that I kind of had to define for myself over time, you know, whether it was useful to my husband, to my family, to myself, to society at large. Um, but that was what made me feel like a valuable person. Um, I wanted to be useful. And, you know, t to today, I always do wonder, and, that, and that's kind of my measuring stick as I go forward, is, is this thing that I'm doing useful to anyone, right? Um, and sometimes it means, okay, I need to take an hour and watch cartoons. That's useful to me because my brain needs a break. Like that, that counts as useful as well. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's like, okay, I'm going to go through this really hard struggle of like right now I'm trying to write a book. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. It's so much harder than anything else I've ever done. But that's also worth it because that will be useful for the people who, who will eventually read the book. So, you know, useful in like small doses, like watching cartoons for my, for like my mental sanity, useful in like big tribulations in terms of like impact to society. Um, but at the, every day it's a, it's the same scale. Is, is this useful? Is it a good use of my time? Do you mind if we like explore this a little bit here, this, this concept yeah. of usefulness here, because it seems like you have an overall purpose and intention, you know, where you go back and you're, you're using that as your compass to, to guide you forward. And when, when you brought it up, it made me think about one of the values we have here at Enjoyment, which is like demonstrate your value. And it's it seems to me that it's like for you, you're like demonstrate your usefulness. Uh, yes. And <laughs> there, there is something really uh, intriguing about your week long shadow experiences there. Um, and there were the two things that came to mind were one, you went out and you did it. You like, I don't need money. I just, I want the experience. I want a chance to do this. And from that, it naturally evolved into something where you realize you can, you can charge money. And you, you said, if they want to work with me beyond the first week. And I felt that was a really, really cool word because it felt it, to me, it seemed like you gave them the experience of Ventress. You're like, this is, this is what I do. This is what I can yeah. offer. And now if you'd like to continue on, here goes how we can do it. Do you mind like, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Can you, can we like, so it's your trial period. Can we like pull that out a little bit more? Tell me about like how that worked for you. Uh, yeah. Right so, so honestly, in the beginning, it wasn't so much of a strategy. It was, you know what? I came from an environment where it felt like everything that I knew and all my skill sets applied directly and only into a Goldman ecosystem. So the skills I, I was fairly certain I had gained some skills there that but most of my knowledge was like okay I know how every single technology system within Goldman works that has, that has clearly that has no no application outside of Goldman so what does so what does my what is my actual intrinsic value to anybody else I couldn't put that into words for potential employers I couldn't put that into words um, for potential partners so for me it was a matter of why don't you tell me how I can be useful to you um, so my initial pitch was, you know, I'm very new to the space. I don't know what my exact value is, but I'm a smart, generally competent person. Let me spend a week with you and see how I can help, um, in anything, whether it's market, it, sometimes it turned out to be marketing. Sometimes it turned out to be web dev. Sometimes it was just product strategy and insight, building out a business model, financial modeling. It was a different thing with a, a different client, but every time it was like, you know, just one week, let me see what I can do for you. Let me see what challenges you're struggling with and how I can apply myself to that challenge. Um, every startup is, you know, if anybody's worked in a startup, you know, every day is a different fire that you're trying to fight. So that also gave me a lot of opportunity to flex my muscles in different spaces. Um, and over time, that did turn into a strategy, uh, an explicit strategy, because I actually got sufficient offers with clients that they wanted to work with me long time. Uh, for like a longer period of time. And for me, it became a matter of 
I don't want to work with you until I know what you're like, right? So why would you want to work with, commit to me if you don't know what I'm like? I view work, consulting work, a lot like dating, right? We should get to know each other before I sign that piece of paper that says I'm going to work with you for a prolonged period of time. Um, so let's spend a couple days, let's spend a week so that we'll do one small project. Um, you know, it, before it was free, now it's not, my time is expensive, <laughs> much more expensive now, but let's do a small project week long or so, so that you have an idea of how I work. I have an idea how you work. Worst case scenario, you spent a couple hundred dollars, a thousand dollars on something that you can at least take and move on to your next consultant or you decide you like me and we can turn this into an ongoing arrangement. Um, I so strongly recommend that to everybody I talk to. Why would you, you wouldn't marry a guy or a gal without going on a few dates. You shouldn't take a job or, or a contract before you've gotten to know your, your potential employer for a little bit either. Um, so obviously I have that, I had that luxury of doing a few weeks of work for free to start with. Um, I had savings, um, that I can live off of, but you know, if you can, if you, so if you, so if you can't, that's completely understandable, but even then you should be like, don't sign a year long contract yet. Pay me for a week. See if you even like me, see if I even like you. Um, Cause it's, it's entirely possible, right? Like dating that we're both perfectly good, well-meaning, well-intentioned people, but we might just not get along. We might just work differently. We might have different views about how this project should go or how this business should go. And in which case that's fine, but let's, you know, cut strings early if that's the case. This is so spectacular. And you talk about like the luxury of like spending time out there with everyone. And I think what's interesting to me is that in my mind, when I play this out here, you coming in for a week and working with a team or working to, on a project is a much shorter period of time than, you know, submitting a resume out into the black hole going through and maybe trying to find a day where you can come in and meet with, you know, four or five different people on a one day. And now I'm taking this dating analogy and just playing it out where I'm like, if, when you say it like that, I'm like, oh, so like each interview is like a speed date, you know, it might be a little bit longer than three minutes, but at the end of the day, do you really both get a chance to know each other? Right. Like how, how does dating work? Speed dating, like 15 minutes per date doesn't really add a lot of value. But if you spend a week with a person, I think you have a pretty good idea of like whether or not you want to s spend more than a month with them. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, can we go to, uh, cause can we go to when you were first thinking about this, not as a strategy, but just like, you know, I, I want to go out there and, and, and be useful to people. And what I'd love to explore is your approach. I'd love to explore your mindset first and then your approach afterwards uh, so that employees can have some something out there. Maybe maybe they have an idea where they're like, oh, we, I can totally do something different because I love unorthodox ways of getting things. I, I'm, I'm about the shortcut or not actually not the shortcut, the smart cut, you know, right. do what works best for you. So, so can you tell us a little bit about your mindset when you were first thinking about this even here? Yeah. So it goes back to trying to be useful. Um, so what I found leaving my job in finance was understandably, everybody I knew was in finance. So how was I ever, how could I, so my immediate thought was how do I build out a network that's not in finance, right? If I wanted to get a job at JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Citibank, I could, I would, I knew the people to get, make that happen, but that wasn't my goal. Um, so what could I do to build up a, a, not just a network, but a quality network within the tech startup industry? Um, my first thought there was, okay, I need to meet as many people as I can. And so I started going to uh, meetups, going to, uh, to startup events. And that was a great way for me to get a pulse on the industry to understand what trends were, what people were looking for, the problems that generally um, startups were dealing with. But it really didn't give me those high quality network contacts. Um, and that for me made me realize the only way I can make this network useful, make them want to pitch for me, is if I'm useful to them. 
So it then became a question of how can I become useful to these people in as short of a period of time as possible so that A, I can, I can assess if their network is valuable to me and if I even want to know this person for much longer. Um, and B, if I can do something for them that would get them to talk highly about me to everybody else in their network. So two things, right? Um, so in the beginning, because I had very little to offer, I felt in the tech, in this tech startup scene, it started off as, well, let me give you a week of my time or a couple of days of my time. Um, as someone who has done a lot of process improvement stuff in the finance world, as someone who has worked with a lot of technology teams, has dealt with really complex systems, a lot of you guys, a lot of the people I, t- were talk- I was talking with were early stage startups. So none of those were directly applicable, but I learned that by sitting with them for a couple of days, I was able to give them insights and advice that they otherwise would not have um, thought about. And there is my definition of being useful, right? Um, it's, that made me realize like there are ways that I can, if I can make every interaction with me, feel like they are leaving a little bit better off than they came into that interaction, whether that's like a tip or an advice, or I built them something, I helped them create a design, I helped them strategize on something, or I even just helped them point out that, hey, that guy on your team is just wasting a lot of time. <laughs> like, um, like there are way, there are like very small ways to give, to be, be useful, and there are bigger ways to be useful. But so long as I continued that general upward trend where every time someone walked away from me, they'd be like, huh, that was a good use of my time. Then I was being useful and the people I was interacting with had more of a reason to to vouch for me when I needed it. There are certain times where I just want to like just give employees a chance to just digest that. So employees, there is real gold here. There are real gold in in just this approach overall. Uh, Ventress, have you read a book called Getting Naked by I think it's Peter Lencioni? No, I haven't. Okay. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to suggest that book because uh, just based on what you do and your approach there, I actually finished it yesterday. I picked it up yesterday and I was like, I was just in it, like all in it. So part of this is recency, but it speaks a lot to like your approach of just serving people first and getting out there and like providing value and seeing where the value is. And then from there, it's just, it's a completely different conversation, you know? Um, yeah. I think it's Brad Feld who says, um, give first is the best approach to networking um, because no one gives anyone anything just for, just for asking. Right. So you got to make yourself valuable first. And I, I love that because like you went through the process of making yourself valuable and you had said things like, you know, you felt that like all you had were just the, the Goldman systems, you know, but at this, and you did do some work on your own to learn coding and do these other things there, but you put yourself in the position to not only add value to others, but it, it seems like through the process of serving and, and being useful to others, you became more useful to yourself in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny because, you know, now looking back, it becomes very clear that like my being useful was a great way for me to also like to build my own network, which is useful to me, which is uh, it's a great way for me to experience a bunch of different companies and a diff- bunch of different industries, uh, which is useful to me. Um, so really, uh, there is it's a win win situation. As long as you you're smart about who you're giving your time to making sure that they recognize and, and reciprocate the value that you're giving to them, um, you know, especially in the in the world we live in today a little bit of kindness goes a really long way. And, um, you know, just get, just get people leaving people who are walking away with a meeting with you should feel like, like it wasn't a waste of their time. Like they're like, ah, oh, yeah, I, I gained a little something there. Booyah. And I love it. Cause you're like, it's not, it's not a high bar, you know, you're just like, just something. Right. Like, like the least you can do is buy someone a coffee. Right. Yeah. And then if you can't do that, tell them about an article you read recently of that, that pertains to their situation or like you just did, right? Like suggest a book that like really resonates with the message that they're trying to craft. Um, You know, that's like the little things you can do. Bigger things are like, well, you seem to be having trouble with your code. Let me help you debug that for a couple of hours. Or, 
you seem to be having trouble with your like customer acquisition flow. Let me take a look at that and break that down for you. So they're like big things. And then there's like small things like a recommendation. Um, and I think as long as you, and, and you know, I come from a very uh, traditional Asian family, which is like really not that great at like American style networking. But, and like, it's very much like, oh, I have to go go out and like sell myself. Well, don't sell yourself. Just go be useful and your skills will sell you for you. Um, You don't have to pitch yourself. You just need to offer help. Um, And that is, you know, a much more, for me, it was a much more natural way of of getting to know people, of showing my value, um, demonstrating it instead of, instead of talking about it. Like I have to say, even for me personally here, you've given me something that I'm like, I'm holding on to as a gift here. I'm like, yeah, Nemo, literally, literally I like to ask myself in the morning, uh, who's one person that I can serve so powerfully today that their life would change forever. And I think that like there's small things, like even just bringing that coffee to that person on that day, perhaps they were having a bad day or you, you gave them the coffee 20 minutes before an important meeting and they had an idea and that one idea kept them on a trajectory that they were really excited with. You just never really know. Yeah. Uh, so can I ask here, I, I want to stay on this line just for a little bit longer um, from the standpoint of, I think there are probably employees out there that are like, all right, let's do this. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to be useful. All right. I am sitting in my car, listening to this podcast, or I'm pumping weights at the gym or running or whatever I am, (laughs) or I'm hanging out with my family. We're all listening to this together. But how do I actually like take that first step? How do, how do I actually get out there so that people know that I am willing to be useful uh, for them? So would you mind speaking a little bit as to, how you bridge the gap between when you're like, I want to go out and be useful and you actually like reached out or got in contact. Like, how did you get inside to help? So um, first you have to be somewhere where there are people to meet. So step one is getting out of your home, getting out of your comfort zone. Um, for me, that was literal. Um, you know, I've, I've written an a, a overly extensive article about exactly how my depression impacted me, but I got to a point where trying to leave the house, exiting the door gave me a panic attack. So for me, that was literally step one, leave the house. Um, you know, some people say that figuratively. I, I, for me, that was literal. Um, so it became a, almost a ritual for me where I made myself leave the house at least once a day to meet one person. Um, so if there was no meeting that I had uh, particularly assigned, I had to find a meetup to go to. So in New York City, that's a little bit easier. Um, for, that meant I just, you know, I just, bring up meetup.com or Eventbrite. And there's, there's always events going on in New York city. Um, and oftentimes within like a 10 block walking radius. So I really didn't have an excuse. So, you know, even if that meetup wasn't directly, so mostly I went to meetups that were like about female entrepreneurs and technology, but even if that wasn't directly applicable to me, I went anyway because it was a op- learning opportunity. There's always someone holding a panel, holding a talk about something interesting, um, and New York city is like the greatest confluence of influencers and thought leaders in the world. So that's a wasted opportunity if you don't take advantage of it. Right. So once a day, leave the house, meet with someone. If I don't have a specific person, go to an event and meet at least one person there. Um, you know, even if it's not something that I, I, that directly made sense for me to be at, I went anyway. Um, and For me, it was ending every conversation with what are you working on that I can help you with? How can I help you next? Is there anybody that you're trying to meet? Is it? um, And, you know, a lot of people who are not comfortable with networking might just say, oh, well, that's nice. Nothing, but thanks. Bye. And that's their loss, right? But uh, there are others who will be like, oh, that's super cool. I've, you know, lately I've been thinking about um, this problem. And maybe you can give me some insight on that. Or if you know if anybody else has been working on that. Or they might say, you know, I've really been trying to meet someone in this space. And when you've been going out to meet one person a day for six months, you're much more likely to be able to be like, oh, actually, there is a person that I recently met in this space that I can introduce you to. Um, so it was just really, really comfortable with learning how to offer help in my language in a way that didn't feel uncomfortable to me. Um, and so for me, it was like, yeah, just and, and let me know. Is, is there anything that I can help you with? Um, 
and it makes at first it made, I felt like I sounded like a customer service rep. You know, is there anything else I can help you with today? Uh, but uh, there's a much more natural way about it these days, um, where I it's it is practically the same words, but um, it's uh, it's just become so much more natural that um, it doesn't stop anybody in their tracks, and and most people take me up on it nowadays. That's fantastic. It makes me think to uh, a book I was reading called The Book of Joy, and it was talking about some of the things that really help people experience joy. And one of the things that allows people to experience it in a more exponential way is a focus on others rather than a focus on self. And it's really clear from from this year that you made it a point to focus on on the others out there. And through it, it came back to you. By being useful to them, it came back to you in a meaningful way. So if you if you had to, we just gone through a bunch of your your journey uh, thus far. You know, if you had to uh, describe, uh, give a takeaway to any employee out there right now who is like, I get it. I've had a possibility. I'm ready to step into it. I'm ready to experience joy here, like on a more consistent basis. What would that takeaway be? Uh, networks networking is always going to feel really awkward when you start off um, flex it like a muscle you got to work it out you got to practice you've got to lean into that discomfort until it starts feeling natural um, I was absolutely not a good networker when I started this journey um, it became something and you know the only reason I can kind of give advice this way is because it became something that I dissected so much about what worked and what didn't work. Um, and it's kind of like going to the gym. It's, it starts off uncomfortable, but after a while, it starts feeling a little bit more natural. After a while, you'll start seeing results. Um, and after a while, you figure out what works best for you. Um, so no matter how shy you think you are, how, no matter how introverted you think you are, the best thing you can do for your career is to build up that network and, and be comfortable doing it. See, that's a lot of fun here. And uh, every once in a while, I like to do this. I'm feeling struck by inspiration, so I'm going to go with this here. And joyees, I'm talking to you right now. All right. <laughs> uh, you just said, Ventress, that it's like it's like building a muscle. Uh, and I think there is a part of there, like with networking and also the being useful to others that I think would be really fun muscles to build over this week. Um but you also said something about like taking it, taking it slow and just like make, building it over time. So employees, I have a challenge for you. I have a journey for you, not a challenge. Like let's play a game. I'm going to rephrase it all because I, because I think games are way more fun. So let's play a game. And in, and in the game for this, this week here is just to reach out to someone and ask that, that special question that Ventures put out there at the end of just trying to be useful to someone. Is there anything I can do to help you with, you know? And figure out your your language with it. I, I really love how you said you're like something that is just kind of authentic to you. But the game is you get points for being helpful to someone this week. I love to hear about uh, the situations that you created that allows you to be helpful. It looks like Ventress went out and just asked. <laughs> she said at the end of every conversation. Uh, so we'd love to hear about this. Let us know how many points you rack up. Um, what I would say is that you win if you get even one point. Like that's all, that's all we're asking here sometime in the next seven days. Do you, you, you agree with that? That's, 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 the, that's the best win you can have. Perfect. So let's, let's do that. Just go out there and then come share it. Let us know about it over in the MJOY community. Uh, we're in the middle of the possibility playground right now and we're just, we're playing with things. We're, we're going to have some fun and create these possibilities. So I want to help you take this and put it into action with this game over here. Thank you, Ventures, for letting me, uh, go out and, and pull that out a little bit and, and just play a little bit with that there. Cause this is, You've given us something that I think could literally, with this one move, shift their entire Yeah, of course. It's it's interesting, too, because I wish someone had told me that when I was still working in the corporate role. I think when you work in a corporate role, you tend to forget that you are still in charge of your career. Um, for me, I was very much just kind of coasting along. And I think if you are a person in a large corporation somewhere that can reach out to the people around you, the people that you're interfacing with, your internal clients, your team, your managers, and if you can be that person to be like, how can I help you with what you're trying to achieve? Um, that opens so much, so many more doors for you internally. 
Um, and it took me leaving the company to, to learn that skill. But I, I wish that I had known how to be a little bit less insular um, with this skill when I was still in a, co- in a company. So I, I think it's even, if anything, it's even more applicable when, you, when you're kind of in a large corporate structure. Well, thank you for being able to put that all out there. Thank you for learning it and, and sharing it with all of us here. I feel like, I honestly feel like I found out like one of the secrets to life here. So I, I appreciate that, Ventures. Now, I am sure that you've been so successful uh, being useful to others here, but I'm also quite sure that things haven't always worked out in a like linear path to success, that upward uh, trajectory there. And what I'd love to do right now is spend some time exploring a failure that you had here and the steps that led up to it. And most importantly, what, how you overcame it, how that failure ultimately led to something important for you here. Because I look at failure as the way to success, not the, not the indication of it being the wrong direction. So would you mind sharing with us uh, a time where you failed and, and the stuff you took to overcome it? Yeah. Um, so as you may discover with trying to be useful and helpful, um, you sometimes fall into the trap of being uh, of overpromising. <laughs> of yes, absolutely, I can help you with that. Um, so for me, especially in the beginning, when I was um, still in my phase of trying to figure out exactly what my my value offer was, if you asked me anything, if you asked me to like build you a house, I would probably say yes. Um, what actually happened was that some of my first clients that uh, that wanted to work with me, they had some asks that were in uh, the digital marketing space and the design space that wasn't really necessarily in my wheelhouse, but I figured I learned how to build a full stack website in two weeks. I could probably figure this out. Um, so I said, yes. And um, yes, I would love to help you. Uh, and also here's a contract, please sign this and pay me money for it. Even though I don't really know how to do it. Um, which of course got me to the point where I was like, oh no, this is harder than I thought. Um, which is fine, which is fine. Right. Like that's, that's a learning curve, but, um, it did mean that I need to, I, so it meant a few things. One, it meant learning how to apologize. Um, but two, it also extended, I, I would learn how to, turn that into an opportunity. And that's when I started reaching out to my network, to my other friends, to get them to help freelancing, freelance for me, people who did specialize in this. So it meant, okay, so I'm not going to take the contract money. I will take the entire sum to pay my friend or freelancer that I hired to get this done. It meant that I came out with no money again, but it meant that I delivered a good product. But also now I hear I'm now funneling work to my freelancer friend. And also then I realized actually that's also a business opportunity. So now my consulting firm is primarily built on a network of freelancers so that I can say yes to projects that I may not be able to do, but I know my, but I know my contractors, my freelancers and my network are able to do. Um, and they helped me fill in all the gaps. So that's how I, so it was really about reframing the need, the, cause the client needed to get something done. They didn't really care that it was me, right? I just happened to be able to sell them the best because for whatever reason, um, they liked the way I, the, the way I pitched that day. Um, but they don't care how it's done. Um, and for me, that real, that made me realize actually now, instead of only having 40 hours a week to work on something, actually I have infinite hours a week because I can give all that work out to my freelance network and make money off of that as part of a commission as a finder's fee. And then on top of that, I now also become valuable to my freelance community because now I'm feeding them work. Um, so that's like a triple win, um, a win for the clients. They get their job done, a win for my freelance network because they get funneled and then a win for me because I get a finder's fee and, um, and everybody's happy. This congratulations on that and <laughs> awesome way of just like reframing that, that need there. And I think, um, that's something that I think is super interesting and important because a lot of times we try and take on things and we feel like, how can we use our past skills? How can we use our past experiences or what we have right now to be able to solve that, that, um, that need? And, you know, 
what came to me was two different things here. Part one of them being that it's about the need, not about like your skills and your experiences. It's not about you. It's about solving the problem and however way you end up solving the problem, like that's okay. And then the other part was just like how how many more resources you might you might have around you than than you might even expect, um, and and getting creative around around that to make that happen. I'd love to hear your takeaway from from this experience for you. What, what would be your takeaway for enjoying? Uh, you have so much more to offer than your current skill set. Um, one, you have an unlimited capacity to learn, and then two, if you can't learn that skill quickly enough, there's always somebody around you who can do it. So use that as a learning opportunity. For me, it was when not only did I ask my freelancer network to help me with a particular task, I would also kind of nose in and be like, so, so why did you do it that way? And, and why did you do it that way? And is how, how did you, what was your thought process when you went through this? And, oh, that's kind of cool. How did you do that? How can I, how could I learn how to do that? And literally by, by having my client now pay this freelancer, I've now received a free coaching lesson about how to do this new thing. Um, and, you know, it's the cheesiest saying ever, but if you want to, you can turn every single interaction into a learning opportunity. I am very good with cheese, like throw, <laughs> throw it out there, Gouda, <laughs> like Parmesan. Trust me, I can make it cheesier than any other moment, but I think that... I, I think I think it's cheesy because it seems simple. It's cheesy because it seems simple, and it's like, well, it has to be more complicated than that. And I'm sure I, I would I would like to ask you this question: What if it wasn't any more complicated than that? What if it was just easy and simple? That would bring me joy. I know that. So let me ask you this here: Talking about joy, can you walk us to a moment in your experience that just brought you great joy? A moment where you really felt like. Wow, this I'm proud of what I've done here or what we we've, we've done here. Uh could you mind walking us through something, a story like that? Yeah, it's um so what I very quickly discovered in my consulting work is that the majority of the clients that I wound up working with were women. Um and in fact a lot of them and the fact of the matter is that, you know, for various historical reasons, women in the US don't have a lot of technical training right? Computer science, um, computer engineering, it's just really not something that they're taught. Um, and there are much smarter people than me who write, who write and talk about that. And there are stats if you want to read it, but that's the case. Um, and what we've, what I quickly discovered is that, you know, there's a lot of conversation about how hard it is for women to get funding in the VC space these days. Uh, but what I also discovered is that actually, even when they do have the money to go hire someone to do it, most software developers are men. And most of them either, you know, best case scenario was like, eh, that doesn't really make sense, but I'll build it for you because it's money or they get dismissed or they get taken advantage of. I've actually had clients who have paid $20,000 to a developer to get something built and all they received back was a stack of code with no instructions on how to use it, which is insane. $20,000 is not a small amount of money. Um, and, but this is like a really big problem that a lot of my clients dealt, deal with. Uh, so for me, it was realizing like having clients actually thanking me for like just even listening to the business opportunity for being able to help them build something in a way that was, that they could understand, um, why things take so long, what the money is going towards, why we build certain things before other things, how we break out a big project into implementable chunks. Um, and it really helped me realize what my role in this industry was, um, uh, which is to help non-technical founders build out the technical side of their business. Because frankly, in this world we live in today, every business is going to become a technology business, whether you like it or not. You can be, you know, Sephora as a makeup company, mostly run on technology. Any, any retail company is mostly a technology company. If you want to be in this, if you want to do finance, that's tech. Marketing, that's tech. It means that if you, if we don't take time to train women and minorities on how to do, be technically literate, then they get left out of this fourth industrial revolution. Um, and that's not okay. <laughs> so, so this, 
so at first it was like, and I think I'm getting off the point of, of your original question. At first it was the point of feeling like, yes, I'm like, I'm really helping these women build these products that they, that like, that they've really wanted to see out into the world. And then secondly, it was like, how do I scale this so that more women and more minorities who don't have traditional tech training and don't even want to, or should, shouldn't have to learn how to program but should be able to communicate in a technical manner so that they can bridge that gap and get their, get their products built. Um, and that's actually like the next phase of my, um, of my career, I think is to start. So this is that, that's a lot of what the book I'm writing is about. Um, it's a lot of the speaking engagements I have coming up are about, and um, some of the online courses that I'm doing are going to be about technical literacy, how to communicate technically. Um, Cause and, and like as soon as I hit on that, like and you could, and I'm ranting because it's it's it makes me feel like fiery. That's the right word for it. It's because every single piece of tech that you use right now, your MacBook, your phone, um, the algorithms behind it, the software behind it, are built primarily by white men. So the only things that are getting built today are whatever white men decide are important to be built. So that means they don't build products for black people. They don't build think, products for women. They don't build products for Chinese people, Asians. So none of those problems ever get addressed. That's why you need to be technically literate. Drop mic. <laughs> yeah, I, I, love, I love it. Like, I, I like to think of like the flames. I'm like, oh, yeah. Be fiery, like let, let's get this out there, Ventress. I think you have more to say re- really quickly here to em- employees here. Like, so let me let me phrase it this way. Um, I'll start with myself first here, but like you've been so incredibly, incredibly like given with your time and your experiences here today. What is one thing that I can do to help you out this week? Uh, I hear you. You you were listening. <laughs> I like I, 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 we're it's a big thing here about enjoyment. We are not about information. We're about application. And I figure I have to lead the way if that's the case. <laughs> so right now I am collecting stories of individuals who are working on problems that are invisible to conventional investors and software technologists and hardware technologists. I'm not picky. Um, so problems that are invisible to investors and technologists who are primarily white rich men to date. So these are women, these are people who are building products that serve minorities and serve women um, that a conventional investor may not necessarily understand. So I'm collecting your stories, I'm doing it, um, I'm putting together a podcast, and um, I'll also be featuring these stories in my book. Wonderful. Can you help illuminate for us here uh, what something that might be invisible to others are? Because what I'm hearing from you is that it's it's a gap out there such that we may not have even known that it was a gap, you know, it's just not a part of our context and our fabric here. So maybe you can give us a couple of examples of some things that you've come across to help spur our. our yeah. So um, from a very, so I'll, I'll give two examples. I'll give like a software example and a, and a hardware example. So a software example that I find really interesting is Wikipedia. So right now, the way Wikipedia works is if you, it's, it's pretty much the source of record, right? Everybody uses Wikipedia for their source of information. But the way Wikipedia works is it, it touts itself as a democratic, crowd-sourced piece of information. Anybody can go in, type in something, and if it doesn't make sense, someone will edit it. If it does make sense, people will leave it in. So there's actually a community of like power users of Wikipedia who very much are always looking at the queue of new submissions and most and, you know, calling people out when it doesn't make sense that you're putting in like a piece of opinion as opposed to a fact. What's happened there is we've just people have there's been really interesting uh, academic studies on it that most of the editors of Wikipedia are men, white men, men. Um, And it's such and that that is the case because the way that Wikipedia was built is that it's very um, confrontational when you say that your edit doesn't make sense. Here are the reasons why. Um, and we're going to scrub it off the site without giving you a chance to respond. That's not the way most women like to communicate. So as a result, a lot of women don't edit Wikipedia. Now, 
the question comes up, which is why is this important? Because a fact should be a fact, right? Whether a man puts it in or a woman puts it in shouldn't be a problem. Well, men and women sometimes interpret things differently. Um, so where this kind of became a problem was there are certain film synopsis, synopses where a female editor may enter that there is a rape scene in this movie. Well, what they discovered is that in a lot of scenarios, in a lot of films, I don't remember the numbers, where a female editor had gone in and noted that, you know, for trigger purposes or whatever, there is a rape scene in this movie. Male editors would go in and say, probably not a rape scene, just aggressive sex, which, as you can see, can be a very controversial topic. Um, who gets to decide it's rape? There are legal definitions of that. But, you know, a woman doesn't want to go on and have to argue with you that this is rape. So how do we build tools from a software perspective that is inclusive to make everybody want to build uh, together the actual source of record without, with, in a way that mediates differences on these opinions without, without putting people out, making participants uncomfortable, right? Right now, the tools are designed in such a way that it's very very much targeted towards a male frame of conversation and argument and debate. So that's one. The other thing that I found really interesting um, is a woman I've spoke, spoken to recently for my book. Uh, she built, she's created a line of workwear for women in mining. So that's that, So that was always really interesting to me. Um, so this is a physical product that's being built. Turns out that there are over 400,000 women in mining in the U.S., in North America, and there are very few options for them. And most of them wind up having to order extra small man sizes for their shoes and their workwear and, and safety gear that for obvious safety reasons, because you're in a mine, that doesn't sound very safe because those things don't necessarily fit you. Um, and when you expand beyond mining, this type of safety gear for work also goes into construction jobs, um, road jobs, uh, and warehouse jobs. Uh, the, that demographics balloons up to like 1.2 million or so on. But the problem there is, so no one is, so she's trying to bring in workwear that actually fit, fits women. Um, the invisible problem there is because nobody's been, been creating this workwear for women, women have been turned down for these jobs. The reason why there aren't enough women in, there aren't many women in mining, construction, warehousing jobs is because they don't have the gear to be dressed up safely to take the job. And if you, especially if you think about middle America today, where a lot of the jobs are just warehousing, retail warehousing for places like Amazon, that's, that may be their only job opportunity, but they can't take it because they don't have the safety gear necessary for it. Um, and by creating this opportunity alone, you are suddenly making employment possible for an entire group of women who were unemployable by no fault of their own, but that the industry did not have gear that fit them. Um, so I'm getting incensed again, but <laughs> those are like, like two very good examples. You know, one is soft, one is, um, you know, one is soft and almost very, and um, and one is hard, but they're both very invisible problems. Until you stop to think about it, you don't really realize how much it has been leaving women out of the conversation. Um, Airbnb doesn't work for black people. Surprise. Like that's another like much more talked about um, example. Um, but like all of those things, there's a lot of things that we could be doing to make industry and economy opportunities more accessible for people that does that doesn't happen because the people who decide what gets built are all privileged people. <laughs> Ventures, I am so excited for all the great things that are coming uh, from this year. And I appreciate you get it in sense. I appreciate you get it in fiery. Like this is I, one of the things I think makes enjoyment so much fun here because I got to talk to people who are passionate about what they are interested in. I got to talk to people who have a purpose and a mission and that, that, that they're working through. And then the entire community is behind you. The entire community is because they also have their own 
possibilities that they're looking to bring out into the world. And like, I just appreciate you putting that out there. And I think that's one thing that, you know, ventures, if you don't mind me saying, you're really good at not just putting yourself out there, but putting like your desires and your, your wishes to help, uh, move people, groups, organizations, teams, and society further. And, I appreciate you for that. And I appreciate like you bringing that skill and being fully you and just embracing that. And like, I just wanted to say that you are completely welcome here to be you and have that come out here. Like you're getting me fiery. I'm, I, uh, that's contagious. I'll take that. I'll take that a lot. Let's all be fiery. There's too much complacency going on right now. Boo, yeah. <laughs> I like that there. So like, so in the aspect here, so now we're all fired up, you know, uh, we've, we've found that like, you know, how to be useful. You've, you've walked us through the mindset, the approach, you've walked us through when being useful goes wrong and how that actually can end up being a foundation for your entire business, that thing there. And then we being, we showed us how you're taking on, uh, helping people shine a light on the invisible problems and giving them an actual platform and foundation to move forward from there. So we are, we are, we are seeing the possibilities that you've created out there. Can you help us now if we turn the light onto each of us individual employees, right? Cause there's only ever one person at a time, right? Uh, luckily we're listened to by hundreds of people. So like every individual person gets, gets their, um, their impact there. But if you had to talk to one person who is on fire right now and you were going to suggest one action that they take in the next seven days to keep that fire burning and to set the world ablaze, what would that be? Go find five people who can help you meet your goal. Whatever the, whatever it is that you're fired up, up about, put a list of five dream people that you can meet that would help you meet your goal. Whether that's Kobe Bryant, whether that's Ariana Huffington, put that list together um, and start working towards it. It's going to take a few years, a few decades, but if those are people who can help you, like if those if that can be a benchmark about like, you know, I'm going to build a business that Kobe's going to want to invest in a business that Ariana is going to invest in. If I'm going, if you work for, I don't know, if you were like me and you were working for a bank and you wanted like, I want like a one-on-one with Lloyd Blank finds and he can know what's wrong with Goldman Sachs for me directly. What, whoever it is, put together a list of your like top five dream interviews, dream coffee chats, and start thinking about how you could get there. Everybody knows somebody who might know somebody who might know somebody who can get you there eventually. So you're not going to get there tomorrow and you're not going to get there next year, but it's a good way to make sure that you're constantly reaching for something. And sometimes that means you've got to build a business that Kobe will care about before he'll talk about you. So you've got to take care of that first, but all the steps just make sure you're still leading up to that goal about that dream coffee date, that dream interview, um, and use that as a as a as a beacon. So keep flexing those networking skills until you get there. I love it. I love it. And employees, I'll invite you to go to the employment community over at employees.com and use the hashtag joiny38. And just let us know your five people. If we each get in there, and I don't care when you listen to this, this could be, you know, we're recording this in 2017. This could be like 2032, you know, like MJOEs, we are, we are a special breed of people out there that will continue to serve and be useful to another. So go out there, use the hashtag uh, joiny38 and let us know your five. And let's see if we can, how, how we can help each other just by, by being there. I'll start off with mine, uh, in there. I'm actually going to take this challenge. I'm like, who would be the five? So I appreciate you putting that out there. Um, I'll tell you who my number one is. It's okay. Michelle Obama. Can you, can you repeat that again there? My number one is Michelle Obama. All right. She works with women, children, and education, and literally writing this book for her. <laughs> That's spectacular. That's spectacular. Okay, now, now I appreciate you putting that into the world. I'm keeping that in my mind as well, so that when, when, when the uh, when the things start to come together, I would love to to be a part of helping to make that come to life. Well, you know, whenever you you meet up with Michelle next, just let her just drop my name with her. Okay, as as long as that's all right with you, I think I think I'm going to go with that. <laughs> um, Ventures, I just want to just say how much I appreciate you. Do you have any final uh, thoughts or final takeaways that you want employees to walk away with uh, here today? Um, 
No, it's always going to be a struggle. There's going to be good days. There's going to be bad days, um, especially anybody out there who's dealing with depression. I talk a lot about it because that's my way of dealing with it. You know, the more I talk about it, the less stigmatized it is. Um, talk about it. Let people know. Share the struggle. Uh, but there are going to be good days. There are going to be bad days. Just always know they're t- whether they're good or whether they're bad, it's temporary. So if they're good, cherish it. If it's bad, just wait for it to pass. Um, and just know time keeps ticking. So get work, get working. Nice, nice, nice. Is there a way that we can keep in contact with you going forward? Uh, yes, you can find me on LinkedIn under Venture Slam, um, on Twitter at Ventresaurus. And uh, my site is VentureSlam.com. You can find all my information there. All right. Wonderful. We'll have all that information over on the show notes page, which you can also find at Mjoyment.com slash VentureSlam. So Ventress, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for sharing your experience. Your Thank you for being vulnerable and open and incredibly useful. Like that was, that has been so spectacular. And uh, I, I want to wish you all the best in what comes next. And I'm looking forward to being a part of all of your future levels and experiences of uh, enjoyment. Here's to doing the things that bring you joy each and every day. Take care. Thank you. Take care. So, employees, your joiny awaits. We had two opportunities today to really make something happen for ourselves and experience more enjoyment. The first one here is an opportunity for you to ask at least one person this week if there's anything that you can help them with. It could be at the start of your conversation, in the middle, or at the end, and quite From what I've found, no matter what, it ends up opening up doors for you. Ventress also recommended that you go and find five people who will help you meet your goal and just write it down, put together that list. So what we'd love to do is share that list with each other over in the enjoyment community. It's fun. It's simple. And every time I say fun and simple, it makes me also think that it's also useful. So head on over to empjoyees.com and come be a part of what we have going on. It's something truly unique. And we're getting, we're spending some time right now really getting to know each other. We're taking on different workshops. We're taking on different types of experiences. And we're creating a community unlike any other out there. And the reason for this is that we want to see you experience that joy. We know that there are possibilities and things that you want to bring into the world. Things that you may not have even been able to admit to yourself. Well, this is a group of people who are high performing and high potential and they are consistently looking to tap into that potential the fun part about that is that they're not one-sided they're multi-talented they're involved in more than just work and it's also part of that that drives them forward because they want to be connected to what they're doing and to the people around them that matter and it's great because in this place we get to work on the things that are truly challenges for them you know something about putting yourself out there and saying what you really want out in the world can go ahead and be quite isolating same thing with being incredibly successful in some of the past activities that you've done and whether you're someone who've had a track record of success and now for the first time you're like i don't know what to do or you're someone who've had a track record of su- success well, i guess these things are actually quite the same, where you're looking to go on and accomplish even more than you've done in the past, but there's no one around you to help guide, mentor, or help you explore that possibility and what's possible for you. Interestingly enough, I do believe that they do all kind of fit in the same category. And that's why this community has grown to be so strong. I'm looking forward to meeting you personally, get a chance to talk to every employee that comes in. It's one of the lucky benefits of being the size that we are right now, because I get a chance to be more hands on than I'll ever have the opportunity of being in the future. So I can say this with absolute honesty and sincerity. I cannot wait to meet you, and to be a part of your journey. Come be a part of this possibility playground that we're having over the Enjoyment community over at Enjoyees.com. We'll have some fun and get some great results from there. And you'll build some incredible relationships. Whenever you're ready, we'll be there making some great things happen. And cannot wait to make it happen with you. Do the things that bring you joy each and every day. Take care, Enjoyees.